Chapter eight, community pharmacy practice. We'll skip over the terms and definitions because we'll cover them throughout the chapter. Community pharmacy, also known as retail or ambulatory care pharmacy, is a vital component of our healthcare delivery system. There are many types of community pharmacies, including independent, franchise, and chain pharmacies. The independent pharmacy originally was known as the corner drugstore in a community. Often these pharmacies were classified as a sole proprietorship. A sole proprietor is someone who owns an unincorporated business by himself or herself, according to the IRS. Many independent pharmacies are compounding pharmacies. Independent pharmacies may also sell or rent durable medical equipment. In addition, they now may provide immunizations to the public. A franchise is an authorization granted to a person or group of people that allows them to operate under a franchisor's well-established trade name and usually under the franchisor's guidance. A chain pharmacy is a corporate-owned group of pharmacies that share a brand and central management and usually have standardized business methods and practice. A chain must have at least two locations and have a central headquarters that is overseen by a board of directors. CVS and Walgreens are the two largest chains in the United States. According to the National Association of Chain Drug Stores in 2012, chain pharmacies filled 2.7 billion prescriptions or 72% of the total number of prescriptions filled. Chain pharmacies may be classified as mass merchandisers like Target, discounters like Walmart and Kmart, and membership stores like Costco and BJ's or Sam's Club. <laughs> The primary role of the pharmacy technician in a community pharmacy is the same as that in an institutional pharmacy or any other pharmacy setting to assist the pharmacist. So yes, that is our main job. And just don't ever forget that. We might have issues with them, but we're assisting them. Without them, we couldn't have a job. So we are there to assist them and assist the smoothness of them making sure there's no drug interactions and no issues with the medications. So we're kind of there to help make sure that they're not distracted by that. So that's very important to remember. <clears throat> So a community pharmacy technician can be um, assigned a specific duty or many responsibilities. More than likely, it's going to be many responsibilities and a lot of multitasking, even though they do say multitasking can lead to med errors. You just kind of have to. So you could provide customer service. And if you're in retail, yes, 100%, you are going to provide customer service. You're going to take the information needed to fill a prescription from customers or health professionals visually scan new prescriptions to ensure that all that they contain all of the required information, answer the phone, obtain refill information from the patient, input various types of data into a pharmacy information system, add a prescriber to the database, add a new patient to the database, update a patient's profile or prescriber's information, add insurance plans to a database, add a drug to the database, enter a new prescription, obtain a refill authorization, process a new prescription for prior drug approval, refill, transfer, file, or reverse a prescription, and run various productivity reports. So you could compound prescriptions, and in that realm, you would be performing necessary calculations before compounding a prescription, weigh or measure amounts of medications for prescriptions, clean equipment after compounding, package and label prescriptions, count the prescribed quantity of medication, select the appropriate container, apply both the prescription and the auxiliary labels to the container in a professional manner, so pharmaceutical, elegant, is what they say. We always want to make sure our labels are straight and not crooked and that they don't, nothing is covered up when we put the auxiliary labels on them. Uh, the last thing in that would be returning the medication to the shelf. You notice I have highlighted that because that is something I really like to touch on because when it gets busy in the pharmacy, especially in a chain pharmacy, you are going to have people from your upfront, probably come and help you. So when I worked at Walgreens, I would there's management and store leaders, uh, team leads who would come back to the pharmacy when we were really busy and they would help us fill. So 
a lot of the times they would leave the medication on the counter because they were just trying their best to help us fill stuff. One thing that's bad about that is, so if I leave the medication on the counter and you're at the other fill station filling and you go to get that medication, you're like, oh, we don't have any. I'm going to put this in out of stock. And then every prescription we get for that that day is going to automatically go into out of stocks and then it's going to order more medication but we might not even need more because we have a bottle on the counter. So that's really important um, to remember, especially when you um, get into the practice of filling prescriptions at a pharmacy. Um, even if it's just, you know, you, you need to put the medications back right away, right after you fill it right back to the shelf. Um, some pharmacies do make you send the medication bottle with to the pharmacist with the prescription. So obviously in that case, you wouldn't be able to do that if that's how your pharmacy ran. But just keep in mind that you might be putting him away. Like the pharmacist might just put a pile next to him when he's done checking them. So you would be irresponsible for putting those back on the shelf if they didn't. And more than likely, they probably won't. You could be pricing medications, organizing inventory, and alerting the pharmacist to any shortages of medications or supplies. Reorder medications and supplies. Check the ordered medication against the packing slip. Place ordered medication in its appropriate place on the shelf. And check pharmacy st stock for medication that may have short dating. Accept payment for prescriptions and process insurance claims a huge thing you're going to do. Most of the time, the pharmacists don't know a lot about insurance. We're usually a little bit better at it than they are because we have way more um, interaction with insurance than they do. Um, however, if you work with a pharmacist who used to be a tech and probably at your same location, like if you worked at Walgreens, they're a tech at Walgreens, um, they probably are really good at insurance as well. So you'll see that from time to time. You're going to arrange for customers to speak with a pharmacist if they have um, questions about medications or health matters. You're going to perform pharmacy housekeeping tasks. A prescription is an order for medication issued by a physician, dentist, or other properly licensed practitioner, such as a physician assistant or nurse practitioner. There are two broad legal classifications of medication that can be obtained only by a prescription or legend medications, and those that can be obtained without a prescription or an over-the-counter medication. A prescription medication is also known as a legend medication because it bears the federal legend which states, federal law prohibits dispensing without a prescription. OTC medications are deemed safe for an individual to take without being under a physician's supervision. As a result of the Combat Methamphetamine Epidemic Act of 2005, a subclassification of OTC medications has been established. These drugs are known as behind-the-counter medications. Behind-the-counter medications and OTC medications that contain ephedrine, an ingredient used to make methamphetamine, which is a Schedule One controlled substance. Individuals who want to purchase products containing ephedrine must buy them at the pharmacy counter under the supervision of pharmacists and have proper identification. The purchaser, the purchaser must be at least 16 years of age. An individual may purchase up to 3.6 grams of products containing ephedrine in one day or normal, no more than 9 grams within a 30-day period. A prescription written by a physician may be given to the patient to take to the patient's pharmacy or mail to a mail order pharmacy. A physician may designate an employee of his or her practice to telephone a prescription into the pharmacy. In this case, the pharmacist must create a written form of the telephone order. A physician's office may fax a pr patient's prescription to the pharmacy. In some states, it is legal for a patient to fax his or her prescription to the pharmacy. However, the patient must provide the pharmacy with the original prescription before receiving the medication. A prescription also may be sent to the pharmacy electronically. This is known as e-prescribing. E-prescribing is the computer-to-computer -computer transfer of prescription data between pharmacies, prescribers, and payers. E-prescribing has many advantages, such as enabling prescribers to receive on-screen prompts for drug-specific dosing information, expediting refills, facilitating data exchange between the physician and the pharmacist and ultimately their patients, linking information from a patient's medical file to a patient's prescription file, 
notifying the pharmacist if a drug product is covered by the patient's insurance plan when the order is generated rather than when it is presented at the pharmacy. This reduce, reduces or eliminates errors associated with illegible handwriting. The first thing a pharmacy technician does when receiving a new prescription is determine whether the patient has had prescriptions filled at the pharmacy previously. This is going to be a huge thing because we don't want to create duplicate profiles. So if we just go in and don't check, we are going to create a new profile from them. Then we're going to have to ask them for new insurance information and it might not be right or wrong, whatever. So we want to make sure that we're using that same profile because then later on someone has to go through and merge the profiles together. So if the patient has filled prescriptions previously at your pharmacy, the pharmacy technician verifies the accuracy of the information in the patient's profile. If the patient has never had a prescription filled at the pharmacy, the pharmacy technician collects the necessary information, which includes the patient's complete name, the patient's home address, the patient's telephone number, the patient's date of birth, and allergies, all allergies, drug and food, patient's current current physical condition, prescription drug card information, whether the patient wants to receive generic medications, a list of any OTC and BTC medications the patient takes, and a list of any herbal supplements the patient takes. This information is used to develop a patient profile for the individual. A patient profile is a list of the patient's prescriptions and all related information, including the original date of fill, refill dates, and the prescribing practitioner. OBRA 90 requires that every ambulatory pharmacy maintain patient profiles. A patient profile is a tool that, tool that can help eliminate med errors. The patient profile is extremely valuable when drug utilization evaluation is performed. During this evaluation, an accurate patient profile can reduce potential drug-food interactions, drug disease interactions, drug environmental chemical interactions, and drug laboratory interactions. In addition, the patient profile can identify multiple pharmacological events caused by medications being prescribed, distinguish multiple physicians that a patient may be using, detect patient non-adherence to the drug regimen, and disclose possible drug abuse by the patient. Originally, prescriptions were written using Latin abbreviations and measurements were expressed using the apothecary and Aver Dupayas systems. Some Latin abbreviations are still used in the practice of pharmacy today. The metric system is the official system of measurement for weights and volumes in the United States. However, some older physicians will continue to use apothecary and the Aver Dupayas systems in writing prescriptions. So here's some of our pharmacy abbreviations, SIG codes, if you will. I will be sending So here's a list of pharmacy abbreviations. They are SIG codes. So we use these with all prescriptions. So this is a good chart to make some flashcards and really study because you are going to need to know these. It's going to literally be impossible if you don't um, for when we get to the math mod, if you haven't taken it already. If you've taken it already, you know that you definitely need your SIG codes memorized by then, um, as well as you're going to need it in the pharmacy to do work. So I'm not going to go through these, but you can... Um, practice them. And table 8.2 shows metric household conversions. So during the math mod, we have a little conversion sheet that we'll give you and we'll be using this, um, these kind of things in this mod we're in currently. A valid prescription must contain specific information. Every prescription is required to have prescriber information, patient information, a superscription, an inscription, a subscription, and a signa. A prescriber's information includes the prescriber's name, office address, and telephone number. If the prescribed medication is a controlled substance, the doctor's DEA number must be included. Some states also require that the physician put their MPI, the national provider, identifier and or medical license on the prescription. So here's the picture of a prescription. And then we have a picture here of a valid prescription label based off of this prescription.
The patient's information includes his or her complete name, home address, and birth date. The patient's birth date is used as an identifier to ensure that the correct patient is receiving the correct medication. At times, an ineligible prescription will be presented to the pharmacy. The individual who accepts the prescription is responsible for verifying that the information is correct. If the patient's name is not spelled correctly, the patient may question whether he or she is receiving the correct prescription. The date the prescription was written by the prescriber must appear on the prescription. If there has been a time lapse between the date the prescription was written and when it was received by the pharmacy, the pharmacist may question the intent of the physician and whether the patient's needs are being met. Some medications, such as controlled substances, must be filled or refilled within six months of the date the prescription was written. It is the responsibility of the pharmacy technician to be aware of any state regulations regarding the amount of time that may lapse from the date the prescription was written to the date it was presented for filling. The superscription is a contraction of the Latin verb recipe, meaning take this drug. It is used as the heading on a prescription and usually precedes the inscription. Presently, the Rx symbol represents prescription and the pharmacy. The inscription contains the medication name, dosage form, strength, and quantity. Today, most medications are already prepared by the pharmaceutical manufacturers. However, the pharmacy may receive a prescription for a non-sterile or sterile compound for which the names and quantities of each ingredient are listed. In this situation, the medication or ingredient is listed by its non-proprietary name or generic name. The quantity should be listed using the metric system. However, some older prescribers may use the apothecary system. The prescription subscription consists of directions to the pharmacist or pharmacy technician on how to compound a prescription. Many of the medications dispensed today do not require compounding and therefore do not contain a subscription. Signa or SIG is a Latin expression meaning to write on label. The Signa is the instructions to the patient on how to take the prescribed medication. These directions are written using English and or Latin abbreviations or a combination of the two. They are transcribed by either the pharmacist or the technician when the information is entered in the pharmacy's computer system. The Signa tells the patient how much to take, when, and how long to take the medication. The pharmacy may receive new prescriptions by a variety of methods. The patient may bring the prescription to the pharmacy. A designated employee from a physician's office may call in a new prescription. The physician's office or patient may fax the prescription or the prescription may be submitted electronically from the physician's office. So before you just let a patient fax, manually fax their own prescription to you, make sure you check with the pharmacist to make sure they're okay with that. Um, usually no. I've never, I've had people ask that and the pharmacist is like, no. So I don't know what the actual law is on it, but just make sure you talk with the pharmacist before you say, yeah, go ahead and fax it to us. Um, E-scribing is the new thing. It's so much easier to deal with e-scribing than a doctor's handwriting. So it's really nice and it kind of speeds things up a little bit because now the patient, we can actually fill the prescription while the patient's on their way to the pharmacy or whatever versus I'm having to bring it, then we have to fill it. So computer systems are standard in pharmacies today because they can provide the following approved efficiency information to the pharmacist at moment's notice, online prescription claim approval, reduction in prescription errors, in speed and processing prescriptions. The pharmacy technician is responsible for inputting the patient's information into the pharmacy's computer information system. Although pharmacy information systems may vary, the system prompts the users for the necessary information. If the information is not entered, the system will not permit the user to continue with the process. Patient information, full name, home address, telephone number, birth date, gender, allergies, generic preference, and requests for non-child resistant containers. Today, many individuals receive prescription drug coverage through medical insurance. Many companies offer prescription drug coverage as an employee benefit. The prescription drug benefit de not, defines the drug coverage that is provided to the member. An individual who is covered under a prescription drug benefit receives a prescription drug card. So here is an example of a prescription drug card. 
or this is a savings card, not actually a drug card. Um, but prescription cards from your insurance are going to be, you're going to need all of the same information, the RxPIN, the RxPCN, the group, and the ID number. You will see these prescription savings cards. People bring them in when they don't have insurance. The National Council for Prescription Drug Programs, the NCPDP, provides a guide for the information found on a card. The card contains the necessary information for the pharmacist or pharmacy technician to process the prescription. Information contained on a prescription drug card includes the following. Complete electronic Transaction routing information information. There, This is a specific identifier used to transmit the claim to third parties. A group number, which identifies the coverage for a group of individuals under one contract. Normally, the group consists of a company's employees. A subscriber number, which identifies the individual who pays the premium. A person code, which identifies the specific individual covered. Some plans use 01 to identify the cardholder, 02 for the cardholder spouse, and 03 for the first child dependent, but some cards do do 00 for the cardholder and 01. So you'll learn those when you're out in the field. A bin number, which is a field in the telecommunication standard that is used for the routing and identification of pharmacy claims. The NCPDP assigns a six-digit bin to process a prescription claim. A help desk telephone number, which is a 24-hour service that enables a pharmacy to obtain assistance in processing a prescription claim. The pharmacy technician must verify that the prescriber's information is accurate in the computer system. The prescriber's information includes his or her name, the office address, the office telephone number, and DEA number for controlled substances only. Depending on state regulations, the MPI and state medical license number may also be required. The pharmacy technician must enter the name of the medication, its strength and quantity, and the number of refills indicated on the prescription. All quantities ordered are to be expressed in metric quantities. For example, four fluid ounces would be entered as 120 ml and one pound would be 454 grams. After the quantity has been entered, the pharmacy technician must calculate the day supply of medication that is being dispensed to the patient. The day supply can be calculated using the fo following formula. So the total quantity dispensed divided by the total quantity taken per day is the day supply. And then it gives you the how to do the day supply for ophthalmic or otic drops and for inhalation solutions. The directions for use by the, by the patient must be entered into the pharmacy's computer system. So the doctors are going to write the prescriptions using abbreviations and SIG codes. You're going to have to translate it. So first you're going to begin with a verb like take. We're not going to use abbreviations in our label because we are assuming the patient does not know those abbreviations. We're going to identify the dosage form. So take one tablet, indicate the route of administration by mouth and use terminology in everyday language so the patient can understand it. The pharmacy technician must enter the approved number of refills from the prescriber into the computer system. The prescriber must provide a specific number of refills for the prescription. Some prescribers may indicate PRN refills on a prescription. In this situation, the technician must be aware of the state's regulations regarding PRN refills. The pharmacy technician enters zero refills if it is a prescriber that does not put any refills on the prescription. If the prescriber authorized a generic drug to be dispensed, the technician will dispense the generic version of the medication. Some states require the prescriber to write dispenses written or brand name medically necessary. So yes, I'm pretty sure it's all states that we have Ross in that is required in their own handwriting on the prescription. Other states may allow the prescriber to check a box on the prescription. So one thing to know is if a patient comes in and says, well, I always get my Synthroid brand name, but the doctor did not write it on there. And they might have forgotten it, but we can't actually write it on there and just be like, oh, yeah, DAW. No, we can't do that. So dispenses written codes, DAW codes are a numeric set of codes created by the NCPDP that are used when entering prescriptions into the computer.
If a pharmacist or pharmacy technician fails to submit a prescription claim using the correct DAW code, the pharmacy may not be reimbursed properly for the medication that was dispensed. So mostly in pharmacy, you're going to use zero. That's just going to be when there's nothing indicated or one substitution not allowed by provider. Prescription adjudication is the process by which a prescription is submitted electronically to a third party payer so that the pharmacy can find out whether it will receive reimbursement for the medication. The pharmacy is notified of the status of the claim within a few seconds of submission. Most of the time, the pharmacy will be reimbursed for the medication. However, in some situations, the prescription claim is rejected. This can happen for a number of reasons, such as the medication is not covered, the refills too soon, or the patient is an invalid card holder. If the prescription claim is rejected, the pharmacy is notified of the reason with a one or two digit rejection code. So you'll see these on the rejections. The pharmacist is responsible for reducing medication errors and drug related illnesses. As a result of over 90, the pharmacist is responsible for obtaining information from Medicaid patients or their caregivers with the goal of identifying and resolving potential medication related issues. Patient profiles are created and contain the following information, which the pharmacist uses in reviewing a patient's medication therapy. Adverse drug reactions, allergies, a comprehensive list of medications taken, disease states, patient demographic information, pharmacist content comments regarding a patient's drug therapy. A prospective drug use review is conducted, conducted during drug utilization evaluation, formerly known as drug utilization review. This review examines all of the patient's medication records before dispensing is conducted. During this review, the following factors are evaluated. Clinical abuse or misuse, drug allergy problems, drug overutilization, drug underutilization, drug disease contraindications, drug-drug interactions, incorrect dosages, incorrect duration of drug therapy, and therapeutic duplication. So this says that pharmacy technicians may be involved with prescription data entry. You will, you will 100% be involved. Um, so you should let the pharmacist know if you get a DUE on your screen. Most of the time though, they're gonna pop up on their screen as well when they check the prescription. Many pharmacies scan the original prescription, therefore a digital copy, copy of the prescription is available when the prescription is refilled. <clears throat> also, if the original prescription is misfiled, a digital copy is available for the pharmacist to review. Scanning of prescriptions is, is a quality assurance tool that can help reduce medication errors. Every prescription fill should have a visually appealing and professional label. It is extremely important that the pharmacist or pharmacy technician affix the label neatly to the prescription container. So we've already kind of talked about this and we've already kind of talked about all of those things that need to be on the prescription. <clears throat> Auxiliary labels are normally printed within the pharmacy label. Most of the time nowadays, the pharmacy, like the label that's printed for the bottle also has auxiliary labels on it. So you don't need to add extras, but just depending on where you work, you might need to. An auxiliary label provides the patient with additional information about taking the medication. Auxiliary labels may indicate when it is best to take a medication or a potential side effect or they may remind the patient to discard the medication after a given time. Auxiliary labels should be affixed to the prescription container so that no important information, such as the national drug num code number, lot number, or expiration number is covered. So we have commonly used auxiliary labels for side effects. So this is kind of a nice chart. Antibiotics, we're always gonna say take until gone with, for auxiliary labels. For narcotics, do not drink alcohol. And here's what that looks like. If you have these old school, we have these in the classrooms if you ever come in for lab. Um, but more than likely, unless you work at a smaller pharmacy, you probably don't have those anymore. The federal government has required that patient product information be provided to the patient when specific medications are dispensed. The purpose of the PPI sheet is to ensure that the patient is provided with information on the proper use of the medication. Examples of medications requiring an accompanying PPI include oral contraceptives, estrogens, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. 
Information contained on a PPI includes the proprietary brand or trade name, the non-proprietary generic name, clinical pharmacology, indications in use, contraindications, warnings, precautions, adverse reactions, drug abuse, overdosage, dosage and administration, and how supplied. After reading and checking the prescription order, the pharmacy technician should decide on the exact procedure to be followed in dispensing or compounding the product. Many of the medications are already prepared for the pharmacy by the drug manufacturers, which we've already kind of talked about this, so I'm going to skip over it. This book does like to repeat itself a lot. So the prescription label should be checked with the original prescription in the manufacturer's label. The prescription should be checked a second time with the prescription in the drug manufacturer's bottle. A final check should be performed before the prescription is begged for pickup. Any medication that appears to have deteriorated or has passed the manufacturer's date should be should not ever be dispensed. <clears throat> Many pharmacies using automated filling machines that include verification by laser technology. The pharmacist reviews the finished product by scanning the bottle and checking the NDC barcode and drug chosen against a prescription. In some instances, the pharmacy may not have the medication on hand to fill the prescription. The pharmacy technician should promptly tell the pharmacist and the patient should be informed of the situation and the pharmacy should offer to order the medication for the patient or to locate it at another pharmacy. Many pharmacies use a tray with a spatula to count solid dosage forms. It is best to count dosages in multiples of five. To prevent contamination of tablets and capsules, the counting tray should be wiped after each use of powder um, from tablets because it may remain on the tray. Some pharmacies may use automatic counting machines during dispensing. High volume community pharmacies may use automated dispensing equipment like a baker cell to dispense medications. So here's a counting tray. You have one of these in your lab kit. And um, if you come to lab on campus, we have these that you can practice with as well. In your lab kit, there is a lab that you're going to use, I believe, um, some of the fake tablets that came in the lab kit. So you can practice that way for the lab, but then you can also practice counting um, just with those pills you have later. Um, because the faster you count, and count accurately. It doesn't matter if you can count fast and you mess everything up, but the faster you can count and count accurately, that is going to give you a huge push over a lot of people in the pharmacy. So this is a picture of automated dispensing machines. When dispensing a prescription, the pharmacy technician may select a container according to size, color, and composition. The selection is based on the type and quantity of the medication being dispensed. A variety of medication containers is used in the community pharmacy, including applicator bottles, dropper bottles, ointment jars, and collapsible tubes, prescription bottles, and round vials. Many of these containers are amber in color and are made of either glass or plastic. The amber color protects the medication from breaking down due to sunlight. It is extremely important that the pharmacy technician package the medication in a container that ensures the drug's strength, quality, and purity. Plastic containers have several advantages over glass ones. They are lighter in weight, are more resistant to breakage, and are more adaptable in design. The Poison Prevention Packaging Act requires the pharmacist to dispense a prescription in a container that has safety closures unless the prescribing physician or patient requests otherwise. The pharmacist is responsible for checking the final prescription before it is dispensed to the patient to eliminate the possibility of a med error. The Pharmacy's information system maintains an electronic record of all filed and refilled prescriptions. The pharmacy is required by law to maintain an actual hard copy of the prescription. The Controlled Substance Act provided two options for filling filed prescriptions. So option one, a file for Schedule 2 controlled substances, a file for Schedules 3, 4, and 5, and a file for uh, all non-controlled. Option two, a file for all Schedule II substances and a file for all other drugs dispensed.
Over 90 requires that an offer to counsel be made to every Medicaid patient who receives a new prescription. Many states have since adopted this to apply to all new prescriptions and refills. Often it is a responsibility of the pharmacy technician to ask a patient whether he or she has any questions for the pharmacist. If a patient has questions about his or her medication, the pharmacy technician should promptly inform the pharmacist. The pharmacist is responsible for identifying and resolving any problems involved with the medication use. Only the pharmacist is permitted to counsel a patient. Let's highlight that. That was super important. You cannot even be like, yeah, I use this and it works really good for whatever they're saying. It should be the pharmacist who's giving any recommendations. Often it is our responsibility to collect patients' payment for the amount due for the prescription. And obviously your pharmacy determines what payment methods they'll accept. And you'll learn that at your pharmacy. For prescription instructions for refilling a prescription are provided by the prescriber on the original prescription or by verbal communication to the pharmacist. A patient may call the pharmacy or walk into the pharmacy to request a prescription refill. The pharmacy technician must obtain the following information from the patient. Patient's name, patient's contact number, prescription name, and strength, prescription number, physician's name, and whether the patient will wait or return for the prescription. Many states permit a pharmacy technician to contact the prescriber's office for authorization of a refill. Depending on the system used by the pharmacy, the pharmacy technician may submit a refill request electronically, transmit effects of the prescription, or use the telephone to call the prescriber's office. It's important that you be familiar with the schedule category of a medication before requesting a refill authorizations. We are not permitted to refill Schedule Two medications. These require a new handwritten prescription, so we don't ever want to call the pharmacy and be, or call the doctor's office and be like, "Hey, I need a refill for my patient on their Ritalin." Um, they would need a new prescription for that. Both federal and state laws govern the transfer of a prescription from one pharmacy to another pharmacy. A pharmacy technician may pull the original prescription from its file or pull it up on the computer system, but the pharmacist is responsible for ensuring that the information transferred is correct. Once the prescription has been transferred from one pharmacy to another pharmacy, the original prescription becomes void. The transferring pharmacist must record the following information from the receiving pharmacist. The date of the transfer, the name, address, and telephone number of the receiving pharmacy, the name of the pharmacist at the receiving pharmacy, the number of refills transferred, the no National Association of Boards of Pharmacy number for the receiving pharmacy, and the DEA number for the receiving pharmacy controlled substances only. The information This information must appear on the back of the original prescription or in the computer system. The receiving pharmacist must record the following information. Date of the transfer, name, address, and telephone number of the pharmacy where the original prescription was filled. Name of the pharmacist at the original pharmacy. Name of refills received. Original date of the prescription. NABP number of the originating pharmacy and the DEA number of the originating pharmacy if it's a controlled substance. The State Board of Pharmacy regulates the practice of pharmacy for that state. Their regulations determine the physical standards for all pharmacies. The standards include the minimum amount of space for the prescription department of the pharmacy. The pharmacy must be well lit and ventilated and the proper storage temperature must be maintained to meet the specifications of the U.S. Pharmacopeia National Formulary for Drug Storage. The prescription counter should only be used for compound and dispensing of drugs and necessary record keeping. The prescription department must have a sink with hot and cold running water. The pharmacy must have adequate refrigeration equipment with a monitoring thermometer for the storage of drugs requiring cold storage temperature if the pharmacy stocks the medication. <clears throat> The board requires that each pharmacy maintain a current dispensing information reference source that is consistent with the practice of the pharmacy. Regardless of the state, every pharmacy is required to have a current copy of the Controlled Substance Act, a current copy of the USPNF, and any other reference ma mandated by the state's board of pharmacies. The state board requires that each pharmacy maintain a current dispensing information reference source that is consistent with the practice of the pharmacy. Regardless of the state, every pharmacy is required to have a current copy of the Controlled Substance Act, a current copy of the USPNF, and any other reference mandated by the state's board of pharmacy. 
A pharmacy is required to have a prescription balance that is sensitive to 15 milligrams in weights or an electronic scale if the pharmacy engages in activities that require weighing of ingredients. The pharmacy must maintain equipment and supplies that are consistent with the pharmacy's practice. A community pharmacy is required to have a security system that detects attempts to break into the pharmacy. The purpose of the security system is to protect the pharmacy department when it is closed. The security system must meet current alarm industry standards and may be a sound, microwave, photoelectric, ultrasonic, or any other generally accepted device. The alarm system must have an auxiliary source of power and must be capable of sending an alarm signal to the monitoring company if the main line of communication is not working. The prescription department of the pharmacy is required to have enclosures that protect the prescription drugs areas from unauthorized entry and theft, regardless of whether a pharmacist is on duty. Only authorized personnel, such as pharmacists, interns, or technicians, are permitted in the pharmacy. The prescription intake window is where a patient drops off the prescription to be filled. It is at this location that a pharmacy technician collects the necessary information that will be used in developing the patient profile. The pharmacy bench is the work area of the pharmacy. Numerous tasks are performed at the bench, including entering patient and prescriber information and prescriptions into the pharmacy's computer information system, adjudicating prescription claims, scanning prescriptions into the pharmacy's information system, pouring and counting medication, scanning the manufacturer's drug container for quality assurance purposes, packaging and labeling the prescription, and the pharmacist checking the final product against the original prescription order. Bagging the patient's prescription is also done there. The State Board of Pharmacy may require the pharmacy bench to be a specific length. The pharmacy technician must maintain a clean and clutter-free work area to reduce the possibility of errors. So this is really important and kind of like going back to what I said about putting your medication bottles back. If we all left our medication bottles on the counter, sooner or later, the counter would not exist. It would just be filled with medication bottles and it would technically be a medication shelf, if you will. Um, a community pharmacy stacks many different dosage forms and the medications are often arranged alphabetically for the various dosage forms. Some pharmacies may arrange the medications on the shelf alphabetically by brand name, whereas other pharmacies may arrange them alphabetically by their generic name. So like when I worked at Walgreens and when I worked at a independent pharmacy, we filed ours all in the pharmacy alphabetically, but we went by the generic name and we went by the brand name. So if the brand name we had in the pharmacy, like say it was Plavix, <clears throat> the Plavix would be in the P section. The generic Clopidogrel would be in the C section and there'd be two different bottles. Some community pharmacies have an area designated for fast movers, which are the most commonly dispensed medications for that pharmacy. So usually you'll see those kind of right in front of them and when they're counting. And then there's other medications on the shelves behind us. The non-sterile compounding area should be away from other workflow to minimize distractions for the compounder and contamination of the product. The area should be kept clean and free of clutter at all times. It should have a controlled temperature and proper ventilation. All equipment and supplies used in non-sterile compounding should be easily accessible to the compounder. All equipment should be examined for cleanliness before use and washed immediately after use to prevent any cross-contamination between ingredients and the final product. Isopropyl alcohol which is 70%, is often used to clean the compounding area. It is recommended that a log be maintained to show when equipment was cleaned. A sink with hot and cold running water and proper drainage is required by all state boards of pharmacy. Cleaning products such as sponges and brushes of various sizes should be kept next to the sink. Disposable paper towels should be kept adjacent to the sink. Trash receptacles should be kept at a distance away from the compounding procedures, and all trash should be disposed of safely and properly, including PPE and hazardous waste. Some of the equipment used in the non-sterile compounding area includes balances, beakers, brushes, cylinders, evaporating dishes, funnels, graduates, metric weights, mortars and pestles, pipettes, sharps, containers, spatulas, spray bottles, stirring rods, and weighing boats or papers. The pharmacy technician should have a firm understanding of the USP 795, 
the equipment used in non-sterile compounding, and the appropriate techniques. Some retail pharmacies may have a sterile compounding area if the pharmacy administers vaccines or provides intravenous medications to its patients. The area must comply with the United States Pharmacopeia Chapter 797. So when we talk about non-sterile compounding, we're talking about USP Chapter 795, the United States Pharmacopeia Chapter 795. When we talk about sterile compounding, we're talking about the USP United States Pharmacopeia Chapter 797. And for retail pharmacies, we are going to use the USP 797 when we're referring to vaccines or other intravenous medications to its patients. Um, most of the time, things that need to be sterile compounded are going to go to a compounding pharmacy or be done in like an IV pharmacy or something like that. Many pharmacies have a designated area where warehouse and wholesaler deliveries are received and checked in by the pharmacy technician. The pharmacy technician checks the medication received against the accompanying packaging slip to ensure that everything ordered was received. The pharmacy technician places the medications in their proper places on the pharmacy shelves or in the refrigerator. All community pharmacies have an area where medication is reconstituted. Reconstitution is the process in which a dehydrated Dehydrated product is returned to a liquid state. The most common type of medication that is reconstituted in a retail pharmacy is oral liquid antibiotics. Distilled water is used to reconstitute oral liquid antibiotics. Some community pharmacies may repackage medications if they provide pharmacy services to long-term care facilities. These pharmacies may have unit doses unit dose packaging equipment to prepare unit dose medications for these facilities. The pharmacy must maintain accurate records for repackaged medications. These records are found in the repackaging log. Table 8.5 pre presents information contained in a repackaging log. So it gives you everything, the date, the drug, dosage form, drug manufacturer, drug manufacturer's lot number, drug manufacturer's expiration date, assigned pharmacy lot number, pharmacy beyond use date, pharmacy technician, and the pharmacist. And then this gives all the descriptions. A beyond use date is assigned by the pharmacy to replace the drug manufacturer's expiration date. The USP has changed its beyond use dating methods for non-sterile solid and liquid dosages forms that are packaged in a single unit and unit dose containers. The BUD is one year or less unless stability data or the manufacturer's labeling indicates otherwise. All community pharmacies must maintain the original prescription on file for the minimum time required by the State Board of Pharmacy, <laughs> including the daily prescription record with the signatures of the filling pharmacist. The pharmacy must maintain all controlled substances invoices for a minimum of two years, according to federal regulations. These records include completed DEA Form 222, DEA Form 41, DEA Form 106, biennial inventories, and change of the pharmacist in charge. Once a prescription has received its final check from the pharmacist, it is placed in a bin awaiting pickup by the, by the patient. These prescriptions may be placed in a secured area outside the prescription de department, not accessible by the patient, where access to the prescriptions is restricted to individuals designated by the pharmacist. The patient bins are normally arranged in alphabetical order. It is very important that patient's prescription be placed in the appropriate bin. So yeah, this is actually a huge thing that happens a lot. Um, you might have a few in your hand, you're just filing them, you might accidentally put them in the wrong bin. Well, I mean, not a big deal, but when the patient comes to pick it up, you go, you see their prescriptions ready, you go to the bin it's supposed to be in and there's nothing there. So then the next thing you're doing is going through every single bin to see if you can find it. And if you can, then you're obviously going to ring it up and give it to the patient. But if you can't, it's going to have to be refilled. Like done again. Some retail pharmacies have a separate pickup window for prescriptions. I notice most of them do not have separate for intake and outtake anymore. It's usually just like a pickup window where you drop prescriptions off as well. There should be a consultation area. A lot of pharmacies now I'm noticing are have um, closed door consultation areas now, which is super nice because it's really hard for them to stand at the counter and have private conversation about whatever's going on.
Within the past two decades, many retail pharmacies have established a drive through window where patients can drop off a new prescription and request a refill or pick up a prescription without leaving their vehicle. The drive through window is an added customer convenience that saves patients times because they do not have to park their vehicles and walk into the pharmacy. So the farm or the drive through window is kind of doing everything in the pharmacy because you're going to have people dropping off new prescriptions. So it's kind of like intake. You're going to have people picking up prescriptions. So like the out window or outtake and you're going to be taking new insurance cards. You might be taking refills. So it really in the drive through, you're kind of learning everything at once. Pharmacy technicians have very strong technical skills that are essential in our practice of pharmacy. These in skills include a strong knowledge base of diseases and their treatment with medication or through behavior modification, solid use of math and performing the necessary pharmacy calculations for compounding, the ability to transcribe a prescription's order for medications, sound computer skills, and excellent techniques for both sterile and non-sterile compounding. Interpersonal communication skills comprise the process by which messages are generated and transmitted by one individual and subsequently received and translated by another individual. Communication consists of five important components, a sender, the message, receiver, feedback, and barriers. The sender transmits a message to another person. The message is the component that is transmitted from one person to the other person. A message may be th a thought, an idea, an emotion, information, or other factors that can be transmitted either verbally or non-verbally. Non-verbal communication includes facial expressions and hand motions. The receiver receives the message from the sender. Feedback is the process whereby the receiver communicates back to the sender his or her understanding of the message. Barriers affect the accuracy of the communication. Nonverbal communication consists of a complex mix of behaviors and psychological and environmental interactions through which a person consciously and unconsciously relates to another individual. There are numerous barriers in nonverbal communication, including body position in relation to the patient, like closed or open stance, folded arms or slouching, facial expressions like wandering eyes, lack of eye contact and tone of voice. The pharmacist is responsible for communication with the technician in a clear and concise manner. Using the proper terminology ensures that the pharmacist and technician share common definitions associated with the circumstance. Individuals assign meanings to their words based upon their background values and experiences. In this situation, the pharmacy technician is responsible for listening intently to the pharmacist. The pharmacist should check with the technician to ensure that he or she understood understood the communication. It is a pharmacy technician's responsibility to request any clarification of the message. Neither the pharmacist nor the pharmacy technician should ever make assumptions because false assumptions may adversely affect the patient's outcome. Pharmacists play an integral role in making certain their patients obtain the desired outcomes with their medication therapy. The role of the pharmacist has evolved from medication-centered to patient-centered care. To establish a patient-centered care environment, it is essential that the pharmacist develop a trusting relationship with the patient. The Institute of Medications, so the IOM, defines patient-centered care as providing care that is respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values, and ensuring that patient values guide all clinical decisions. To provide patient-centered care, the pharmacist must be able to build a therapeutic alliance with patients to meet mutually understood goals of therapy, develop a self-awareness of personal effects on patients, foster an unrestricted relationship with the patient, identify the patient's experience as unique, and understand the patient's illness experience. Often pharmacy communication is delayed due to specific challenges from distinctive orders posed by a unique group of patients. As a pharmacy technician, it is a vital vital that you sense an individual has a specific problem, you check your perception of that individual. If you are dealing with elderly patients, what is your initial perception of them? Are they forgetful? Do you consider them to have a visual or auditory issues? Based on your perceptions, you make assumptions about this group of patients. 
The elderly population is increasing and living longer as a result of advances in the treatment of diseases and disorders with medication and behavioral modification. The elderly experience more chronic conditions than do younger individuals and therefore take a greater number of medications. As individuals age, they may experience a loss in their communication skills. Also, as individuals age, they tend to process information at a slower rate. The rate of speech and the amount of information an elderly patient receives at one time must meet the individual's ability to understand the information. Also, they could have short-term memory recall and a attention span can be reduced. Hearing impairments may occur when something blocks the conduction of sound into the ear's sensory nerves. So an elderly patient may develop hearing impairments. Dysarrhythmia is a speech impairment involving interference with the normal control of the speech mechanism because of damage to specific facial muscles. Dysarthria can be caused by Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, strokes, and accidents. Often patients with a speech impairment may communicate through the use of notes or sign language. A pharmacy technician should always have a pad of paper at the prescription intake or pickup station for patients who want to communicate by writing. So if you have a deaf patient, that's probably how you're going to communicate, how you're going to communicate. Aphasia is a complex condition in which an individual has a reduced ability to understand what others are saying and express himself or herself. Depending on the severity of the problem, an individual may have no speech or may have difficulty with names or words. Some patients with mental health disorders may be hesitant to speak with members of the pharmacy staff for a variety of reasons. These reasons may be a poor self-image and hesitancy to interact with other people. These patients may believe that they have a condition that may make some individuals feel uncomfortable. Some patients may not feel comfortable interacting with healthcare professionals. The pharmacy staff may also have difficulty relating to these individuals. They may feel uncertain about how much information they should provide to the patient. Also, the pharmacy staff may not know what the prescriber has told the patient about his or her condition. When speaking with patients with mental health issues, it is best to use open-ended questions. Patients suffering from mental illnesses should not be treated any differently from any other patient who has a condition such as hypertension, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, diabetes, or thyroid disease. Every patient should be treated with the same dignity and respect. Many individuals find it difficult to interact with terminally ill patients. They may feel uncomfortable discussing the topic of death and experience difficulty finding the correct words to use. Most terminally ill patients need a supportive relationship with family, friends, and health care providers, including both pharmacists and technicians. Often, the pharmacy team may be the only health care provider in the community that a patient may encounter frequently. In 1969, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote On Death and Dying, which identified five stages of grief. According to the American Medical Association, health literacy is defined as the ability to read, understand, and act on health care information. Annual health care costs for individuals with low literacy skills are four times higher than those with higher literacy skills. Limited health literacy increases the disparity in healthcare access among exceptionally vulnerable populations. Literacy skills are a strong predictor of an individual's health status than age, income, employment status, education level, or racial ethnic group. 90 million people in the United States may be at risk because of the difficulty some patients experience in understanding and acting upon health information. One of five American adults reads at the fifth grade level or below, and the average American reads at the eighth to ninth grade level, yet most healthcare materials are written above the 10th grade level. Patients with low literacy skills were observed to have a 50% increased risk of hospitalization compared with patients who had adequate lit literacy skills. Problems with patient compliance and medical errors may be based on poor understanding of healthcare information. Only about 50% of all patients take medications as directed. Communication issues develop when information is provided to the caregivers of patients with chronic conditions, parents who take care of children with acute illnesses, family members, or friends. A caregiver must understand a patient's condition and treatment and how to effectively communicate the special instructions to the patient. It is extremely important for the caregiver to understand the importance of refilling the patient's medication.
The pharmacy technician should apply the following techniques when addressing any patient. Avoid using professional jargon. Avoid using words with more than one meaning. Develop a sense of trustworthiness with the patient by demonstrating friendliness, a sense of ethics, sociability, and fairness. Recognize that there are differences in cro cross-cultural styles of speaking. Use simple ideas and words when obtaining information from the patient. Customer service is defined as the provision of service to customers before, during, and after a purchase. Customer service in healthcare is different than other industries because the customers are recipients of medical services that are critical to their health. The pharmacy provides OTC, BTC, and prescription medications to its customers and patients. In addition, the pharmacist provides information to patients to maximize the therapeutic effects of the medications they are prescribed. The five rights of medication administration used by nurses also apply to pharmacy practice. They are the right patient, the right medication, the right time, the right dose, and the right route of administration. Table 8.6 shows the common pharmacy customer service complaints. I called in my prescription refill two days ago. Why isn't it ready? My doctor said they would call the prescription in right away. My doctor told me that I would be on this medication the rest of my life. What do you mean there are no refills left on the prescription? The prescription was for 90 days and you gave me only a 30-day supply. What do you mean my prescription card will only pay for a 30-day supply? The wait time is too long to fill a prescription. What do you mean my prescription card will not pay for this medication? What do you mean my prescription coverage will not pay for this medication? I'm going on a trip and I need to have my prescription refill before I leave. What do you mean that if I want the brand name drug, I have to pay more for it? Why did my doctor prescribe this medication if it's on back order? Why didn't someone call me to tell me that my doctor wants to see me? So those are common complaints that we see in the pharmacy a lot. Um, your attitude can have a direct effect on whether a pharmacy customer comes back, and it can also alter your image as a technician. So one thing to remember is if you, for any reason, get into some kind of I don't know what I want to say, altercation, not altercation, but argument, I guess, with a patient or there's um something happening between you two and, you know, whatever happens, you might start yelling at each other or they're yelling at you and you're defending yourself, whatever happens, just keep one thing in mind. They're going to come back to the pharmacy. They're not going to stop coming to the pharmacy because of you and you're going to have to wait on them and it might be awkward. So the best thing to do is just try to keep your cool when talking to patients, even when they get upset and angry. If you get upset and angry, it's just going to make them more upset and angry. And I know that's one of those, you know, easier said than done kind of things, but um, just keep that in mind. I've experienced it as well. I've had patients yell at me. And at the end of the day, I was stressed and was like, you know, yelled back at them, not in a disrespectful way, but just telling them what the issue was. And they never stopped coming to the pharmacy. I still had to wait on him and he was yelling at me and in my face. So um, if I wouldn't have yelled back at him about what was happening, he probably wouldn't have done that. None of this would have happened. So just kind of keep that in mind. So your attitude can have a direct effect on whether a patient comes back. So your appearance, your attitude, your efficiency, and your helping out. Going the extra mile and assisting other coworkers when they're overwhelmed will make you a star worker. Coworkers will also return the favor when you need it. Box 8.2 shows customer service statistics. Many community pharmacies provide immunizations to the patients. These include immunizations for influenza, pneumococcal infection, hepatitis A and B, herpes zoster, and varicella. Currently, only pharmacists are permitted to administer immunizations to patients in most states. However, pharmacy technicians can help facilitate immunization programs and reduce some of the barriers to providing superior service. Specific tasks that can be performed by pharmacy technicians include documentation, billing, assisting in the reporting of adverse events, and facilitating communication. Technicians can also take an active role in pharmacy-based immunization programs by obtaining cardiopulmonary resuscitation training and certification. The pharmacy technician is permitted to draw the correct amount of the vaccine into a syringe for the patient. So actually a lot has changed since this book has came about. In Michigan, we are actually allowed to give immunizations now. Your workplace may require you to do some sort of immunization training, meaning you're not going to get done with this program and just go give shots. But um, 
you will be able to give immunizations in most states. And I'm sure, especially since COVID, I think it's almost every state, but I'm not 100% sure. Another requirement of the ACA is medication therapy management, which we refer to as MTMs. This is a medical care provided by pharmacists whose aim is to optimize drug therapy and improve therapeutic outcomes for patients. MTM covers a broad range of professional activities, including but not limited to performing a patient assessment and or a comprehensive medication review, formulation formulating a medication treatment plan, monitoring the efficiency and safety of medication therapy, enhancing medication adherence through patient empowerment and education, and documenting and communicating MTM services to prescribers to maintain comprehensive patient care. Often patients will need to purchase equipment or supplies to use at home. They may have been hospitalized and now need further care that can be done at home without their caregivers or with their caregivers. Community pharmacies often have a part of the business that supplies these products known as durable and non-durable equipment and supplies. So usually like they're the little pharmacies, they will. Um, an example of durable equipment would be a hospital bed or wheelchair, a non-durable product, maybe a job stocking or diabetic or ostomy supplies. Today's community pharmacy provides even more of these products for services for their patients for a variety of reasons. The number of elderly patients has increased, resulting in a growing need for these products and services. Patients prefer to be treated and to convalesce in their homes. Services at home are less expensive than staying in a hospital or assisted living facility. The patient is able to maintain his or her independence. Technology has evolved such that traditional treatments now can be performed in the patient's home and managed care supports the discharge of patients from a hospital to home. Most community pharmacies have provided crutch, crutches, canes, and walkers for patients. When the, within the past several decades, some pharmacies have expanded their inventory to include these products. Some community pharmacies have contracts with long-term care facilities to provide medications for the residents. Long-term care facilities include subacute care facilities, correctional facilities, assisted living facilities, and board and care homes. As in a traditional community pharmacy, technicians assist the pharmacist in providing long-term care services. Packaging for long-term care services is different from the traditional bottles of 30-day supplies of medication. The packaging is in blister cards of or strip packaging that make it easier for dispensing and changes to orders. So that's what that looks like. You should have that in your lab kit. And we do have them in the classroom with the rollers. So you can kind of practice that. And usually if a pharmacy does do contracting for long-term care facilities, it is going to be in a separate area. So that way you're not confusing, you know, regular pharmacy with that. Pharmacy technicians perform many of the dispense tasks associated with packaging for long-term care medications that were previously done by pharmacists. Some of these responsibilities assigned to pharmacy technicians include billing prescription, OTC, and non-drug services, entering computer data on prescription drug and non-drug orders, maintaining a drug library, maintaining delivery records, and so on and so forth. Many of today's community pharmacy settings have incorporated wellness and disease prevention roles for technician. The pharmacist is now an integral part of the patient's overall well-being and disease management for diseases such as diabetes or heart conditions, and these are included in the prescri prescription dispensing process. For example, a patient who is a smoker and has been instructed by the physician to stop. They may have questions about patches or other forms that best suit them. A diabetic patient may need to purchase a meter and has no idea of which one or how to test. The technician could help choose a meter and align the strips and lancets that go with the product chosen. Other OTC medication options is another area that patients may need assistance with in, in the community setting. So technicians must understand that OTC medications and even herbal or vitamins um, can have interactions with other medications being prescribed and helping to maintain an electronic record of these is essential to a complete profile. 